I want to bring you two texts today on which we are going to base our message of obedience. The first one is Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. Speaking of Christ, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Though he were a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In those two texts, there are two words I would draw your attention to. First, the word learn. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. We learn by study, by experience, by practice. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He studied them, he experienced them, and he learned obedience from his suffering. And the other word is, he became. That's a change. He became obedient. He learned obedience by what he suffered. He became obedient unto death. That was the completion. He became obedient unto death, even the death of a cruel, agonizing crucifixion. He became obedient. He learned obedience. He became obedient. And if you read the end of the context of Philippians 2, God highly exalted him for that obedience. And it also says that because he was obedient and because he became obedient unto death, the Bible says that because of this, he was made perfect and became the author of eternal salvation to all who will obey him. So there's quite a lot there about obedience. Jesus learned, he studied, he learned from his experiences of obedience. Jesus became obedient in the flesh. Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I find it difficult for my natural mind to fully understand that God found himself in fashion as a man. And that God had to learn. And God became obedient in Christ. What was the inspiration that made Christ obedient? What was the motivation to achieve anything in life in any realm? We need a motivation. We need a goal. We need an inspiration. We need something that's bigger than ourselves that we're willing to really work at it, whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's ambition, whether it's a business, it will never succeed unless that person has a, a driving force that will not stop. 
What was the driving passion that made Christ obedient? I was talking over this in fellowship in our family circle and I posed a question what is the greatest passion that God has? What would you say was the greatest characteristic of God? And after discussing it for a while, we changed our minds and we thought this way and that way. And we came to the conclusion that because God is perfect, then every one of his characteristics are perfect. It would be very difficult to say one is stronger than the other. But our general conclusion was that the great holding, controlling factor was his love. That somehow all the passions of God, anger, judgment, justice, were all centered in this all-embracing love of God. And it brought out some amazing thoughts. If God is perfect, then his judgments must be perfect. Now I don't think, after serious consideration and thought, I don't believe we can understand the love of God until we understand the awful judgment of God. For it is only when we have some understanding of the terrible condition of a lost soul forever that we begin to get a glimpse of what God's love really is. Can God suffer in eternity? Does God suffer in eternity? Can God suffer in a perfect heaven? Well, I can give you one scripture right away. It says, the long suffering of God in the days of Noah, when the earth had so violent that God repented he made man, was sorry that he made man, was filled with anguish of spirit that he'd ever made man. That's what the Bible said. But his long suffering, because he did not want to destroy man, but eventually he had to bring the flood and we were talking about this in the family circle. And there was an amazing thing that he said after the flood. He says, I will never do that again. Almost as much as if he said, I, I can't stand that. That awful thing that I had to destroy my own creation. That's the conclusion we came to. That it wasn't a vindictive judgment, but a long suffering of God until he was compelled to do it. And after he'd finished, he said, I'm not going to do that again. I think we get an insight in something of the love of God and his long suffering. The driving force, the motive for Christ's obedience. I believe that the whole of the Bible points to the cross. All the shadows, all the types, all the examples in Scripture, all the New Testament writings, to me, they point to the great central theme, the cross. Paul says, I am determined to know nothing but the cross of Christ, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. For here, we see embodied in this tremendous atonement all the long-suffering of God and his great love to save the lost souls of men. 
And I believe, I truly believe that the driving passion and force behind Christ's obedience was the love for lost souls of men. For he knew more than we could ever understand or realize the awful condition of a soul lost forever. He describes it in language of symbolism because it is impossible to grasp. Fire and brimstone, wailings and gnashings of teeth. The modernist and those who would twist the scripture try to water down hell, but it's a very real place. There was no need for Christ to die an agonizing death on the cross. He wasn't to save men and women from being lost forever. There's no other warrant for him to go to the cross. And if we deny hell, we deny the very love of God to save us from it. Listen, listen to the heart of God. He desireth not the death of a sinner, but they may turn from their wickedness and live. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. His whole face was set as a flint to accomplish that task. And I want to tell you, unless we get an appreciation of the awful agony, the terrible condition of a lost soul in hell, we will never have the passion and the love of God to win the lost and be obedient to Christ. Church services, activities, nice singing will never give us the burning passion to serve God in utter obedience that one lost soul may be saved. Thank God this morning some soul that is eternal heard God and cried out amongst us in humility, God save me. Thank God for that. And I believe that's a confirmation of the message. The driving force, the great passion of God is to save. That which is lost. It seems to me that God keeps putting off the day of judgment. If his love is so mighty and if his judgment is so terrible, it's as if God asks, cries out, I do not want my creation to come under my judgment. Is not that why he sent Jesus? God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Should not that be the inspiration of our obedience to the commandments of God? Not that we may go to heaven, but that we may be obedient that lost souls may come into the knowledge of Christ. If your salvation means anything to you, then you must realize what a wonderful saviour we have. Amen. He was obedient. And Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. It is twice recorded in the scriptures in the New Testament that Jesus wept. I've always been intrigued and exercised of what it meant in John chapter 11, I think it's verse 35. They say it's the shortest verse in the Bible. But what a profound depth of love is in that verse. It says, Jesus wept. And I've asked myself time and time again, as I've read the story of Lazarus, Martha and Mary and brother Lazarus had died and been four days in the grave and Jesus came, and it says he wept. And I thought time after time, why did Jesus weep? I can't believe that it was because Lazarus was dead, because he knew he was going to raise him. Let me give you one or two scriptures from John 11, verse 4. When Jesus heard that he was dead, he said, this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified. He knew he was going to raise him. In verse 11, these things said he, and after that he said unto them, 
our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may wake him out of his sleep. He knew he was going to raise him. And in verse 23, Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And then in verse 40, Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou should see the glory of God. And in verse 42, he says, And I knew as he prayed to God, I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And then he cried, Lazarus, come forth. And he came out of the grave. Christ knew he was going to raise Lazarus. I cannot believe that he wept because of that. But it not only said Jesus wept, it said he groaned within himself. Twice in John 11, we read that Jesus groaned within himself. It says in verse 33, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. I cannot think it was because Lazarus was dead so much because he was going to raise him. And then later on, as he came nearer to the place of death, verse 38, Jesus therefore again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. What was it that made Jesus weep and groan? There's something that cannot be understood by the natural mind in spiritual emotions. For a man can have waters of tears flowing from his eyes without feeling very much at all. The spirit is not a human kind of emotion. A man can have tears like rivers flowing from his eyes and yet not feel all that deeply about it. It's an amazing thing. I don't say I know the answer to this. But I know one thing. It says Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. I wonder. I ponder on the thought that when he saw Lazarus. He saw the tomb with the stone on it. I wonder if it reminded him that he was going to the cross, that he would have a sepulcher with a stone like this, that God would raise him from the dead. I wonder if this is the thought that came to his mind. And I don't think he would weep if that was the thought because of the suffering of the cross. I believe he was willing for it. And I don't believe it was because he would face death for he knew he would rise again. I believe that when Jesus saw this, somehow it moved in his bowels of his spirit, that great passion throughout eternal ages, that he'd come to seek and to save that which was lost, that he would be rejected of men. That's what he suffered. Love suffers. Every morning in the Old Testament, the chosen people would get a spotless lamb and it would be placed upon the altar of sacrifice. And every evening of the same day would be another lamb, spotless, laid upon the altar of sacrifice. And day in, day out, year in, year out, it would be a perpetual sacrifice and a memorial of the coming of the Savior. God was seeing that all through the history of Israel, preparing for the cross. And he knew that he would be rejected. For the Spirit of Christ in Isaiah spake out, and I'm sure with a heart of sorrow. A man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, rejected of men. We esteemed him not, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of his all. 
I wonder, I feel that somehow Christ has suffered from the foundations of the earth. The lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. And his suffering was not even rejection perhaps, although that's an awful thing when love is rejected. When the great salvation, the crucified Christ, the love of God is thrown back at him. And people go on their careless way in this world without belief in eternity. That must be an awful thing. But I think more awful was not so much the suffering or the rejection or the agony. I think it was the passion that souls should be lost. Those made in the image of God should one day be fulfilled as the sons of God and enjoy bliss and fulfillment forever in eternity. I'm sure this was the great titanic struggle in the heart of God and Christ. That when he wept, he was thinking of the poor lost souls of men. I don't think Christ was weeping all that much about his own suffering. Surely that must have hurt and his rejection. When he came to Jerusalem, both in Matthew and Luke, we have records that he, he wept over the city. And oh, can you hear the cry? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I would have gathered thee like a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you would not. And you knew not the time of your visitation, and now your house is left unto you desolate. And you'll see me no more until the day when you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And I believe the heart of Christ wept there. Yes, I'm sure he, he wept that his love was rejected. But even more, that his dear chosen people were so blind they couldn't see. And that he'd have to go through awful problems and troubles. And when we think of the Gestapo and the concentration camps and the millions of Jews that were gassed and tortured and slaughtered throughout the world since the cross. Christ's heart must have bled when he said, I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Does he not cry out to mankind today, I would gather you at the cross, come unto me, all ye that are burdened and heavy laden, I will give you rest. I have not come to condemn you, I have come to give you life. And that much more abundantly. Don't be deceived by the glitter and the glamour and the excitement and the pleasures of sin which will destroy your soul and separate you from God and take away from true happiness and true joy and true love. Can't you see? I'm dying for you. I love you. Will you be saved? That's the cry of Christ. That's where Christ suffers. And that's the driving passion that made him seek and save that which was lost. Oh, the wondrous words of God. He that was in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, was made in the likeness of men, and humbled himself, and made himself of no reputation, and hung naked on a cross, and was shamed and spat upon and rejected. And he was obedient even to death, the death of the cross. I believe it was the passion and the love of God for the lost souls of men. And I believe that that passion was inspired to by the knowledge of God that his judgment would be terrible in the extreme. Oh, that the fear of God would come upon men. All oh, that our spirits would catch the awe of the majesty of God that one day we shall stand before God in judgment and without the cross he can do no more than to banish us forever and our eternal soul will spend eternity without God in awful conditions all oh, that men would understand. He desires not the death of a sinner but they may turn from their wickedness and live. I don't know whether he wept in Gethsemane, but in Hebrews 5 and verse 7, it does imply it. 
Let me read you what it says. The fifth chapter of Hebrews. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, it sounds like Gethsemane to me. And was heard in that he feared. And though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. What a tremendous scripture that is. In Gethsemane, he had to fight alone, he prayed alone, he suffered alone, he went to the cross alone. But it was not self-pity. I don't believe it was even the rejection of man for him, for love is bigger than that. I believe it was the passion, the agonizing desire that not a single soul would be lost. That is the inspiration. That is the motivation of Christ's obedience. And every time he suffered, he learned. Don't you think it's amazing that he took upon the form of man and was tempted in all points like as we are and had to learn? What a marvelous expression. He was found in the fashion of a man. Almost as if to say, when Jesus was born and he'd willingly come and made himself of no reputation. It's almost as much as to say, when he was born, he left all his glory and his power behind. And he had to start to learn to live in a little house of clay. From the tiniest immature baby to the grown man who died upon the cross. What a love. And he did it because he doesn't want us to perish. What can we learn? Well, I believe we can learn obedience ourselves. If we are obedient because we fear hell, that will never be strong enough. I've never known fear to be a very good motivation. It defeats its own ends. And I don't think it will be our good lives that will make us obedient. I wonder whether even the vision of becoming like God would make us obedient. I don't know. Some people would say, well, I'm not sure whether I want to be that good. I don't know. It's a mystery. But I'll tell you one thing. One thing that I'm absolutely sure of. One thing that I can say without any doubt in my mind. If any soul gets the passion for lost souls of men... A real godly passion inspired by God. I'll tell you something. They'll be obedient. In the measure that they love lost souls, they'll be obedient to God. They'll learn from their sufferings and their rejections and their disappointments. And they'll be obedient even to death. No wonder Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. I believe the greatest inspiration for our obedience is to have a passion, a love and a passion for the lost souls of men. I believe that is the very heart of God. It's not he that saith, Lord, Lord, that enters the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of God.